Welcome to Global Connections on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Today, we're going to talk about Ukraine and Russia, the current stagnation and the current complications. Our guest for the show is Rupmati Kandakar, our geopolitical analyst. Welcome to the show, Rupmati. Hello, Ajay. Thank you for having me on your show. Always my pleasure. We want to know about the current status of the conflict between Ukraine and Russia. Uh, the current positions of the armies of both sides, uh, their immediate goals, their funding, their weapons, their ammunition. Um, and we want to focus on the repercussions of the U.S. election on this conflict. And how will the change of leadership in Washington affect support for Ukraine? Wow. A lot of things to discuss. So let me ask you first, Rubani, um, what's the situation in the incursion? Because that's the hot news and that's what Zelensky would like us to focus on. Yeah, Jay, uh, we are living in peculiar times when there are wars going on and uh, it continues for two years, three years down the line. So uh, what stunned the uh, uh, headlines and what brought us back to this topic in our show also is that uh, Ukraine stuns Russia by attacking uh, Russia. So I, I mean, you don't believe this kind of thing, but uh, Ukrainian soldiers managed to push many miles into uh, the border of a town called Sudza. Sudza in um, uh, the north uh, of Russia, northwest. What happened here is Jay, a very um, um, coordinated attack. And um, when you talk of Russia being invaded by Ukraine, it is a uh, anti-thing of every kind. So uh, let's just take a look at what actually happened in this offensive, and then we can go down to uh, detailing the repercussions of it. So the offensive took place in this border town, uh, border region of uh, Kirk and a stretch of 300 miles into the Ukraine-Russia border. And uh, what this, this area was the one from which Russia had launched its offensive uh, when it started the campaign. In and uh, It's a 300-mile territory of the Ukraine-Russia border. So, uh, Jay, in 2020, uh, 24, when uh, in May, when the Russian forces crossed into Ukraine from the Belograd region uh, and they targeted the second largest city of Ukraine, uh, Kharkiv, this was the place. And uh, then what happened was President uh, Volodymyr Zelensky and his officials started uh, building up this media attention that... Uh, there's a concern that there would be a Russian attack in the northern region of uh, Ukraine. So you had these uh, uh, speeches being given. And so uh, in this region of Sumi, um, Ukraine started building up troops. And that went across, uh, you know, everybody ignored it because this was what they were saying, that they expected an attack from Russia and the Ukrainian troops were building up. Uh, what happens is Ukraine struck uh, Russian infrastructure in this Kirk's region. Jay. And this attack was such a planned move that when they launched this attack, it was very fast. And the major impact was because uh, it attacked infrastructure. Jay. It was a five-part like movement. When they first came in, they uh, they were moving towards uh, this uh, uh, Sudza. And the uh, first thing that they did was that they uh, uh, they had special forces to enter this area. Secondly, they cut off all the uh, internet uh, so that the Russian troops could not report um, this incident to the reinforcements. And uh, third was that there were, this was uh, a brigade of around 19, 20 uh, vehicles, uh, tanks, armored vehicles. And in those tanks, you had uh, the uh, US uh, military tanks of uh, um, Bradley and the uh, armored vehicles of Starsky. So, uh, and uh, Jay, uh, the first person view FPV drones, which cost around $1,000 each, they were sent in a large number. Now, each cost $1,000, but each was uh, attacking a, a Russian T-90 tank, which was costing $4.5 million. So see, this gave them a unprecedented uh, advantage and uh, see the balance that they took over uh, like you always say, asymmetrical uh, balance of power towards their side. So they had these, uh, this, and because it was a motorized brigade, they were moving very fast and they were uh, crossing the Russian uh, heavily guarded checkposts 
they went inside and they returned to attack from the back jail. So because they were light, they could move fast. And because they could move fast, the Russian soldiers could not understand where to block them. So uh, this was uh, what happened, Jay. And they moved and uh, took over around 386 miles of uh, Russian territory and around 80 settlements. So the Ukrainian commanders were very swift in their uh, campaign. Jay. And it stunned the Russians. So if you go into Russian territory, although uh, the surprise the surprise characteristics of what Zelensky did here um, are admirable. Uh, how hmm. far can you go and how long can you stay um, before Putin responds? Um, and so what kind of response can can the Ukrainians expect from Putin, uh, either, uh, you know, in Susa uh, or in the Donbass up, up north? Um, it, certainly, uh, Putin has been humiliated. He's been caught short. His army looks, you know, uh, very weak, and um, uh, he's got to respond. So what kind of response can we expect? Jay, um, it was first uh, Vladimir Putin uh, expectedly had a very angry response to this whole thing, and he, he spoke in a very firm tone and uh, ordered first removal of these people from uh, outside our territory. But these people had already left. They attacked and they left. So uh, you couldn't actually, they were not tenting over there. This was something like, a, uh, see what I can do to you a scenario. It, they were not uh, waiting there to post uh, themselves into it. So uh, Vladimir Putin's uh, first instruction was to remove them out of Russian territory. And second, Jay, we have to await is that he will come back with a very heavy response. But Jay, in these, um, what do you say? The foothold was never there. And the Russian um, Russian military convoys, which were smashed by these um, um, fast-moving Ukrainian brigade, uh, just brought about humiliation on Russia. The Russian uh, 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 troops immediately had, the because they were overconfident, they had left these roads and these entry points um, uh, unguarded. So they have these fortification pyramids, which are being constructed on all the roads. If you see them, they're like, uh, if you visualize them on the roads, on alternate sides of the road, uh, at every distance, uh, there are uh, these pyramids built which, with which the tanks cannot maneuver themselves because still, uh, because of this attack, the Ukrainian um, uh, brigade had a clear road into Russia. So now there is fortification on. So he's taken these uh, um, steps. And Jay, the main, um, the main plan of this uh, attack was to attack Russian infrastructure. They didn't just want to, they, they did not take lives, they did not do anything. They just wanted to come and show how much damage they can do. They will come to the point that uh, why we discuss why uh, Zelensky uh, did this. And uh, so uh, what this, um, this uh, infiltration, this operation cost Russia, uh, cost Ukraine. And was it worth uh, um, the the go for Ukraine to do this. So um, that is another part of the show. Well, it's impressive what he did. Uh. And it's impressive that he is, is trying to um, damage infrastructure and leave those pyramids behind. But he's ultimately going to have to pull out, isn't he? Gee, um, Kiev uh, by, uh, was seeking to divert Moscow's resources from other parts of the border front line. Now, in the heavily uh, fighting areas, Ukraine's forces are literally exhausted. They are facing uh, a shortage of manpower in these regions. And uh, Russian forces, like we know, uh, they are stronger than uh, Ukraine. And uh, Russia pulling out of it now has become an ego battle, isn't it, Jay? This incident... Uh, gives it a twerk of being uh, humiliation and ego. So now the question of withdrawal is a far uh, fetched. It just pushed the option off the table, Jay, of withdrawing. Mm. It's like guerrilla warfare on a larger scale. I mean, Zelensky goes in, he does what he wants, um, he achieves his mission. At some point, he's going to have to pull out or move. 
Um, and the question I put to you is, is this, uh, it's a great strategy. And the other part of it, of course, is that it gave world attention to Zelensky. If we were worried about, you know, Western Europe not, not being so concerned anymore, or the U.S. not being you know, so concerned anymore, this, you know, brings it to the top of the news cycle, and it gives Zelensky and the Ukraine, Ukrainian army some real attention. And that's good. He needs that. Mm -hmm. He wants that. He's got to have that for funding and weapons and, and general support. But it just strikes me, and I want to ask you about this, that uh, this was uh, so successful that it's likely he can and will do it again, not necessarily in Suits, but in some other place inside the Russian border. What do you think? You're right about this, Jay. This is what he was seeking to do, the narrative that he was seeking to achieve. And Jay, we can safely say that this operation was never about military goals. It was about non-battlefield goals. Uh, now, uh, why this is? Because, see, the U.S. alone has been spending $55.4 billion on Ukraine aid. It's a huge, huge amount. And, uh, Jay, this um, campaign was like an uh, like a mini advertisement or, uh, uh, you know, a sleek uh, shot into what Ukraine can do. And whoever wins, he, was, he gave it like a... Uh, USP for uh, Ukraine saying that whoever wins the elections, please keep funding going on for Ukraine because even a small operation can shake up Russia. So uh, he 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 was very uh, Zelensky was very shrewd in this, uh, and he's not uh, he's just focused on his own funding, and uh, it gives it it gives him enough uh, footage to say that when we can go inside with the American Bradley with the F-16s, with um, the striker uh, vehicles and um, dent Russia. Imagine what we can do with, you know, more funding, more uh, uh, equipment and more manpower. So he was just very selfish in this point that he was uh, just pushing the Ukraine cause to the next presidential candidate election winner. You know, so what you have here is uh, American equipment. We don't know if there are American weapons involved, but you just named a whole bunch of transport vehicles and tanks and the like um, that came from the U.S. And I wonder if that's consistent with, um, you know, the, the conditions that Biden laid down on providing those weapons. When he was asked a day or two ago uh, whether it was consistent, uh, he kind of sidestepped the question. But is it consistent? And uh, do you think that the Ukrainians are using American weapons also? Yeah, they they, they did use some missiles, but uh, it was such a uh, there was no evidence left of this attack. It was just to show that they can enter and come out. Uh, it was not a full head-on uh, uh, battle or collision, and there was no uh, fire exchanged as such. The Russian forces mm. were more of a uh, the uh, stunned reaction that they had. There was no combat. So if there was combat, maybe we had seen more weapons being into use. It was just these vehicles trotting in, getting into heavily guarded check posts, taking a U-turn inside and taking hold of these settlements. If uh, it was, uh, and uh, Jay, the T-90 tanks being destroyed uh, places and anti-aircraft missiles being ready, but not used. So uh, that was just, um, uh, I think he, he abided, abided by the, rules given by Biden, but Jay, this uh, uh, this incursion could have led to a very explosive reaction if they were very well armed in that area, because that area was relatively uh, less populated with Russian forces and they're busy fighting the uh, northeastern region. Uh, his, his tactic could have easily backfired. So it was a very risky operation that he took. He has a couple of notable benefits. He, he uh, took prisoners. He took hundreds of Russian soldiers as prisoners. Um, mm. And, you know, some of them were happy to be taken because <laughs> they felt their chances of survival were much greater as prisoners for Ukraine uh, than fighting on the front line for Russia. But now uh, Zelensky has hundreds of Russian prisoners. And, you know, the newspaper is suggesting um, that they will be used in some kind of prisoner exchange. Was that a good idea? And will they be used 
uh, in a prisoner exchange. And I, I should add one other point that uh, Zelensky said that this move uh, is calculated and will likely lead to a peace agreement. So I need your thoughts on all those things. Uh, his concept of uh, taking prisoners and trying to hold uh, Putin hostage for this kind of uh, uh, scenario is very, very bleak, Jay, for me. Because uh, Putin is not the kind of person who will sit on the negotiating uh, table. He will pursue his... He's a hardliner. And for, uh, you know... Uh, uh, we see in other conflicts when you um, when you negotiate and uh, uh, you know you talk for uh, exchange of prisoners of war and hostages that is when you value life if this man had valued life he would have never attacked ukraine and uh, three years down the line he is just taking lives daily in and out so he is not coming to the table for vladimir zelensky just to sit for exchange of russian prisoners day that is really uh, if uh, Zelensky is thinking of stretching it to a peace agreement, it's not going to go forward because he did. Did he come to the table in the peace agreement which took place in Switzerland? He didn't. There are peace agreements being signed everywhere except with the Russian signature. So he's a hardliner. And for him, it does not matter what comes in between his motive and his aim. Uh, lives are secondary. State power authority are primary for him. He's always thinking of his own Russian authority. For that, many lives can be laid down. That is the thing. Well, he was certainly humiliated. And one of the uh, um, threats that he made was the use of tactical nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. uh, he's been holding back on that over the past year. But um, now he's you know trotted that out again because he's been so humiliated and has to get even. Do you think, Rupmati, that he will use tactical nuclear weapons. I hope not, Jay. It'll, you know, it'll take our entire contemporary system to a whole new different level, Jay. Right now we're on F-16s and T-90s. That is very fine and that is okay. But if, like I told you, this, this campaign was never about military achievement. It was just about pricking and advertising his own funding. But it caused, a, uh, it caused hurt to the ego of a czar of Russia who, who's, you know, he's a um, megalomaniac in his mind. He only thinks of uh, Russian dominance in the international system. It is not about Russian existence. It is about Russian dominance. He wants to take back Russia to its lost glory. So uh, when you hurt the ego, uh, hurt the ego of such a person, it's going to bring about repercussions of a different kind. See, Zelensky is very... Um, symbolic in his uh, uh, in his offensive, he will he will uh, blast the bridge that Putin loves. Uh, he uh, you know he will blast infrastructure which Putin has uh, nurtured, and then that becomes kind of you know hurting Putin day in and day out. An offensive from him will be very um, uh, strong this time, and uh, he will not stop. Jay. That is the problem. He will not stop. He doesn't have any external influence on him. He is his own mind and he is not a person who gets influenced by what is written about him or uh, so. And he's a statesman for 24 years. He knows the entire system uh, in and out. So Zelensky is uh, from a comedian to an entertainer to uh, into politics. So he has switched careers. So if you go to see his experiences, not as much as uh, uh, Putin and his tactics are very short uh, lived. When you are in your statesman, your political statesman, you have to have long-term goals. And Zelensky falters in this that he always has short-term goals. It is about his immediate funding, what will be about immediate budgeting, but he never thinks about the long-term goals. If he had thought, I told you in the beginning of one of our shows, that if he was a good leader, he would have said, let me take it down a bit, let me surrender, let my people be saved, and I will live to fight another day. That would have been, it would have saved many Ukrainian lives that time. So uh, a good general or good leader, commander, always takes care of his people first before going into battle. If you don't have enough resources, they are they are being tested to the limits, Jay, on the Ukraine-Russian border. It's hurting Ukrainian people. But I want to add one other thing, two other things. One is uh, you, you talk about the, um, you know, the, degradation of the Ukrainian army. There was a piece the mm. other day about how they, they're they now bringing women in. 
uh, on mm. the front lines. They they usually they usually have men on the front lines, but now they're bringing women in. And Rupmati, I hope you do not volunteer for that. There, I would. I would <laughs> hope. <laughs> anyway, the other point uh, is that um, we are learning about new strategies for a war of this nature. They did not only the Ukrainians did not only you know the surprise and the hit and run uh, kind of attack. They also destroyed supply lines. And mm. so uh, Russia used uh, these bridges to carry uh, troops and munitions into the fight in Ukraine. Um, Zelensky blew up three bridges. Um, and it's not likely that the Russians will be able to rebuild them so quickly because of drones. And so what we have here is an example of a strategy that, that is likely to be copied elsewhere uh, and in any event, replayed in the war between uh, Russia and uh, Ukraine. So uh, war, we've talked about this, war has changed. And this mm. is this incursion and the destruction of these bridges uh, is just another way. By the way, there's a, there's a nuclear power plant in this area too. And just as the Russians have compromised Zaporizhia in Ukraine, uh, the uh, Ukrainians may very well be able to compromise the Russian nuclear uh, power plant in Russia. So <clears throat> all of these things are kind of a, a different kettle of fish, aren't they? Yes. I wanted to ask you about one, one thing that has got to be um, you know, on the table, and that is the reaction of the of the people in Russia. You know, we know he's humiliated. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to know that that humiliation is because he's afraid that people will not see him in the same way. He's been pushing a narrative with all his state-controlled media for the duration of this war, this invasion. Um, and now uh, he can't help uh, but have them understand that the invasion goes two ways. This mm -hmm. is a remarkable uh, development, and it undermines the narrative that he has spent so much time and effort developing. What is the reaction, if you can figure what is the reaction of the Russian people who know about this or will know about this? Jay, uh, for these uh, people in power who, who who rely on these heavy tech, uh, you know, incursions to fuel their popularity, domestic population they have to uh, they have to garner support from domestic population just on the basis of their nationalism. They play to the uh, patriotism of uh, the domestic population, and when such a thing happens. Uh, Putin will uh, gain gain more strength in saying that now we should fight for our Russia and we should get into, you know, he will go in that direction rather than say that, you know, we are weak and all that. He will go into the point that he will be justified more uh, of his um, fortifications, of his uh, uh, asking for manpower, uh, that kind of this these incidents really make them stronger in the domestic uh, zone because though the Russian people are very, must be very happy about it, they cannot voice their opinion in a uh, uh, open manner, transparent manner. They have to keep on continuing that, yeah, he is the best for Russia. And when Putin plays on their nationalism and on uh, how much they love their country and how their country should be protected, it takes it into a different direction rather than anybody, you, you, we, you, you know it, how voices of criticism are dealt with in Russia. Uh, they are, they are they're squashed. So uh, they have to go for it. How about the world? I mean, we'll get to the US in a minute, but how about the world? When they see this, this incursion, what do they think? about the um, ability of Ukraine to, to uh, engage in this way. Yeah, Jay, uh, see, the Rush, uh, the world leaders exactly have been doing this. They have been turning blind eyes to all these two wars that have been going on in the international system. They don't really, uh, they have not backed up as a community. Individual support has been coming in, but no community uh, resolutions coming for any of these um, to wars and uh, disputes turn into wars so fast and the international community has generally been stunned with this they have applauded Ukraine but they have treated it as a one-off incident one-off uh, um, possibility 
this can't happen again and again and this can't uh, be a full fledged attack because if that kind of a brigade had faced the russian forces the answer would have been different if there was preparation the russian forces were better prepared but it was taken um, uh, as a surprise attack the element of surprise in the guerrilla warfare so it was successful but uh, everybody gauges that a head on attack would have um, uh, been advantage russia well if we're looking for you know press coverage and all that we have to look at what russia is doing what putin is doing in response in the donbas he's stepping up his invasion in the donbas how well is that going and uh, will that ultimately turn the turn the tide on this in in his favor? Eighteen percent of Ukraine is already occupied by Russia. Eighteen percent. That's around one fifth of one fourth of your territory just being taken by uh, Russia over a span of two years. They will keep on coming in, and now because of this incident, it gives them a more uh, uh, it gives them more validity to enter and occupy more places because. When Zelensky's uh, forces came and occupied Russian territory and 80 settlements, J, 386 miles, so that's a huge uh, place to occupy. And um, the Russian forces now have to show their side retaliation. And uh, Jay, if you go to see, retaliation in these wars has uh, always been on uh, the point, like if you take the Israel-Iran Iran conflict, they have given up on some things they have uh, brought things the tempo of the uh, war down a bit to avoid confrontation both the sides iran and israel but in uh, um, russia and ukraine's uh, offensive if ukraine pinches uh, russia thrashes that is the kind of uh, balance the imbalance that is over there so he has no control he has no um, whip on him you know, uh, we're sitting right in the middle of the Democratic National Convention. Mm. I, I find it interesting that there are lots of protesters uh, outside the convention hall in Chicago who protest uh, the Israelis' efforts to defend themselves against Hamas. Um, but there's nobody protesting on either side on the Ukraine war. Maybe that's one of the reasons that Zelensky wants to get back to the news cycle because he doesn't think people care about him anymore. Uh, on the other hand, it is uh, a platform point. It's a platform point ultimately for Joe Biden, uh, who uh, you know has a few months to go and has to follow through on his on his position, and of course uh, Kamala Harris, who needs to continue that position or find a better position going forward. Um, and of course, uh, you know, Trump, Trump, who has said he'd give away Ukraine on the first day. So a uh, question, you know, how, how does all of this interact with the fact that they're talking about platform points in Chicago and that they're running for office on the basis of those platform points? Uh, how, how will this affect American policy and American support of Ukraine? Jay, we have very clear uh, points uh, on both the sides, Democrats and Repu Republicans, about the Ukraine war. And the funding that has gone in, that is a $55 billion funding, which can be, when you have recession in our own economy, this kind of figures hurt. Uh, so uh, it, becomes, it becomes a fading point for all uh, conventions. And they talk more about Israel rather than Ukraine. So that gives an imbalance. And when these conventions and um, debates are on, Zelensky used the timing to highlight his cause, Jay. It's very clear that it was a narrative that he was uh, uh, advertising on the international board. And now when he goes to every platform, like he uses each and every platform given to him, the Emmys, the Grammys, the uh, Met Gala, anything you want, he will use that to come across. And when he has this kind of uh, a feat and achievement, he will take it to every platform, forum, EU parliament, uh, American Senate, and um, ask for more funding. His goal is very clear, Jay. He wants more funding till he can win the war with Russia. And he doesn't say that he wants to go for a uh, ceasefire with Russia. He talks of winning the war with Russia. So that's kind of... Uh, uh, very, I feel 
very hypothetical because you cannot you can bring it to a halt but you can't defeat Russia. Ukraine can't defeat Russia unless it has got the collective uh, it makes it a collective nuclear war realistically mm. speaking yeah some people say that in the long term Israel cannot survive without American support so American support American diplomacy is really really important now well, mm -hmm. I'm so happy that we had a chance to talk about all these issues. This, to me, is very important news. It's very important analysis. And I really appreciate you coming on. But let me ask you, how should your listeners, our listeners, think about this now? It seems like it's an inflection of some kind. Uh, what should they be thinking about in terms of uh, viewing the whole matter in Ukraine and its war with Russia? Jay, this entire conflict is now not going to stop. It's, it, it is, this offensive has given it more impetus to carry on ahead. Uh, if you were thinking of any coming down or backing down of both the parties, this has given a new flair to the entire conflict. So the conflict actually restarts and re refuels itself. And now it has to go to the next stage because the ego of the uh, <laughs> Russian has been hurt to an extent which he could not have fathomed. Uh, it would have, uh, it was unexpected and this surprise attack has literally surprised everyone and just given fuel to the fire. Well, thank you, Rupmati. Rupmati Khandakar, uh, our geopolitical analyst. Thank you so much. And thanks to our listeners for watching. Aloha. Aloha, Jay. Thank you very much.